Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I suppose in terms of the contracts, I, I was kind of thinking, in, in, this I suppose, the theory is the formalisation of everything, uh, a formalisation on paper with signatures at the, at the, at the end of it, of everything that has been discussed today, uh, it's about the various sessions, is trying to formulate that into as concise as possible a document, clear but concise. So I suppose we want to um, uh, tease out the issues uh, with regard to that. So I just let, let the three uh, panelists give uh, a quick overview of where they see their role in contracting and how it reflects the relationship between the uh, uh, touring company and venues. Uh, one at a time, we have um, Diego, who we've already uh, been introduced to earlier on. Uh, Aoife is from uh, Philippine Solicitors and does a lot of contracting, not necessarily in theatre, but certainly in film and uh, uh, in the film industry, and will give an overview in terms of the actual legalistic the very the strict legalistic um, uh, parameters that, that, that uphold contracts. And then Sean, Sean Kelly from the Everman Palace Theatre uh, in Cork, who will talk about this, this in terms of a theatre venue, if the various types of contracts uh, uh, and the types of uh, production companies and promoters and, uh, across the broad range of, of contracting. So we start with David. Sure. Um, so first of all, I think it would be great if there was a standard contract that most venues use because, you know, if, when we tour to, let's say, so the autumn will be touring, I think, to, well, this year we'll tour to 13 different venues. So if I have to go to 13, and uh, say me and all of us as a team at, at Irish National Opera, um, if we have to go to 13 different contracts with different clauses, you know, in different places, it's just time consuming. Whereas if there could be a standardized contract or close to something like that, it would save a lot of time for the producers and tour managers to, to, to work through the contract. So there's just a, that's called theater form, you know, not here in the world. Um, and, and the same, by the way, with marketing, how, how venues gather marketing information and technical information. If, if it was a standard, a standard across as many venues as possible, and again, it saves a lot of time. So instead of me filling out ten different forms, I can fill one out and send it to another. And this may be a, a, a very simplistic question, but do, do you feel that that? If, I mean, I know a lot of venues, uh, and you probably agree with Sean. We, the, the, when you're initially drawing up contracts and making changes to them, you tend to look at what another venue has done. Show me your contract, let me see mm -hmm. what, what... Do you find a lot of difference between contracts with, uh, with venues? Well, the, just the way they're phrased and laid out. I mean, the, the basic points are all the same, which is when and how much. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's all the way <laughs> but, um, but so, just looking at this contract, which your firm has drawn up, you know, mm -hmm. if, 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 they all, if they all follow the same kind of format, <coughs> You know, so that you know uh, what to look for in clause seven point one. You know, it's, it's kind of a clause. I'm just saying that that it would be that would be helpful. And uh, Sean, do you feel that? Because I mean, what, my immediate response to that is that exactly that. It is just when I'm doing up contract, it's it's three points: uh, when, how much, and you know, the maybe a little teasing around the get in and get out times. But therefore, you know, could, could every single, are you saying could every single contract be exactly the same? What do, what, do you, what's your uh, I mean, to a degree, I think that would have been a cut down on some of the questions that the companies we haven't dealt with before. Um, you know, questioning phraseology and what this really means if we all had a set of a template, that would certainly help. I mean, I think it's inevitable that there'll be some differences, you know, locally there's different practices and different culture and, Terms of marketing and you know, you do different things and you know, to prove the supply and stuff like that. Um, and so, the, it, uh, so many differences I think are unavoidable, but I think it would certainly help, and hopefully will help, if there is a more standardized contracting system. Though we have two separate, you know, we deal with an awful lot of different types of companies, types of shows with contracts divided into two types, which is a rental and a some sort of agreement for me to say the show was some fox off split of guarantee. Um, so you know the rental contract again would be would be quite different. I think this would 
this one is probably more based on you know, to remodel those guarantees and use it. And can I do you have separate contracts depending on the um, we do the we do for rentals. Um there because you know most companies when they rent you don't get the short as well, they stand to make more money so there is more risk on them and less on us, but there's great incentive for them, so there's less marketing support, um, you know, you're just hiring the the other space, so they you, know, you get less in the way of support from the venue as a consequence. Um, so there has to be you know, a somewhat different contract on that basis. Often it's you know, sometimes it's kind of stage two and things like that that they rent off so you know, they're operating differently, so it has to be used set of expectations at all. They're also working with children quite frequently, so the contract then has to be clear on child protection and you know, how you can chat to them and you know, issues like that as well. And in terms of making sure that those kind of um, clauses are adhered to, like for instance, the great bane of the venue manager's life, the insurance, getting the proof of the insurance, or getting the proof that the organisation has a child protection policy if they're bringing children. How, how do you how do you find the um, policing of that? Um, it can be tricky. The child protection policy is usually easier because there's just no way you could proceed without seeing some of these child protection policies being able to work with the children. And it's very rare that a company works regularly with children now who doesn't have a child protection policy. I just like to present anybody in that particular area who sees what it's kind of funny. And the insurance thing can be tricky, and um, we have on occasion lost insurance because somebody didn't think they could go ahead, or lost booking, you know, quite early in the process because somebody didn't think they could afford insurance or didn't know how to go about it, even though know, we tried to put them away with, you know, our own broker. And they, or they, you know, sometimes people are just a bit intimidated by it or they think it's going to be really expensive before they even check it out. But it can be quite hard, and often you're left, you know, to right up the last minute before. The insurance is <laughs> and are you know, and other documentary proofs like risk assessments that you're chasing you know, is you have to be really persistent to get those. And Dylan, can I ask you in terms of the technical side of things? Um, because it came up earlier as well, I think Roland mentioned it, uh, about the communication between the venue manager and the technical manager and making sure <coughs> what's in the contract. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of what came up in the initial meetings for today as well. Um, that I've had different experiences uh, where um, my role in uh, in a different venue would actually be to source some of that documentation you're talking about, um, child protection policies, risk assessments, as part of the negotiation of the um, event into the venue, and then um, so that was. That was, I always found a bit strange because I felt it should have all been done before it even came to kind of initial meetings about the event, you know, and, but you were still chasing child protection policies mm -hmm. right up until the day, you know, <coughs> maybe it's slightly different in um, more centralised venues, but when you go out and you're, you're in a local venue in a country town where everyone knows each other and the local group has been doing this for years, you know, then to kind of talk to them about uh, uh, guard vetting and child protection, they're still not really even understanding what that what that means, you know, for them. They don't they don't believe that they need it. Um, although most recently that has become uh, less less of an issue. Um, the only issue I had really was that the contract is, as you can see, is quite dense. I'm not, you know, we're not lawyers and and, and uh, we're trained in different things. And the the contract itself um, has to be kind of quite generic and. Then uh, there'll be kind of there is a, a generic kind of sentences which gets everyone out of trouble if need be, but really, um, you know that it's for the then the production manager or the technical manager of the venue to uh, document and archive actually what the what the venue is providing and what the, the show is providing, and that never goes into a kind of contract paper form. Really, that usually comes through the text spec or the banner we've talked about already today. Um, so, and do the, you sorry? Do you think it should be? In, no, I, I just um, what what I what I kind of was leading to was that um, 
we they have the contract done, and then we um, luckily, if you've got good administration, they will gather all the. And I think insurance is more probably the key thing that people get straight away. You know, because they like yeah. it's a like it's a it's a it's a certificate that the, that the insurer provides. So it's kind of like you know not that difficult to get if you're if you're if you're insured. Um, and what happens with I think well our contracts here maybe is that that's all that's all available for us to look at at any time if we need to. Um, on the administrator's desk, but uh, not necessarily. We wouldn't have the time in in pre-production or then even post-production to go and check it uh, to find out what had maybe been agreed or not agreed. And there would be program meetings. Uh, so some venues have regular staff meetings, and, and, and I think that's about internal communication. Mm. We talked about uh, regular staff meetings and one-to-one -one meetings where maybe you would go through the program, and that's where all those issues would be. Highlighted verbally, um, but it's uh, it's quite it's quite difficult to look at the tech specs and then the, the, the all the pre-production and then the contracts and then you know uh, if you're if you're doing that for seven events a week you know on top of actually physically putting the work in putting the putting the events in so um, in a similar way we're talking about streamlining uh, the details of an event you know it may be a, a streamlined document that. The contract goes into so I even just the, the knowing that it's a split knowing that it's a guarantee people treat it very differently companies coming in companies coming in hiring the venues commercially and um, you know we've got to, I've got to know this over the years anyway so I can you know, you know how to uh, change your uh, your way of working with companies um, very quickly but if a company is on a split or a young theatre company and quite nervous coming into a venue you know, it's because it's it's a new process for them, you know, so you might be a bit more considerate. Um, if it's a company who's been touring for 20 years and uh, the same old problems are coming up, even with professional promoters who promote events year after year, year, after year they're always trying to um, break the contract. And actually it's known within the management team, it's known within the company staff team because they're doing it with marketing, they're doing it with... Um, they're doing it with administration, they're doing it with conference. They, they will say that um, they'll provide something, they'll demand it to be paid for, and they may not even <coughs> pay for it afterwards. And so it's up, it's up to the administration then to kind of um, catch, you know, um, force companies to pay for whatever they've agreed to pay for. But um, sometimes the more experienced the company, the more they'll try and get away with it, you know. Uh, so I, I, what happens usually within my own work, working practice or the production manager's practice is that they will go ahead and look ahead of schedule and say, right, well, this is a uh, split, so we have a certain responsibility to that company. This is a full guarantee, so that company really should be providing everything or should be paying for everything or, or we should adhere to what we've agreed in the contract, you know. Um, uh, but some sort of filtered document, maybe as well. I know that uh, that they would go into a pack for each company. We we we're quite good at collating all that information into yeah. into one area here. But usually, in other venues where I've had problems, is that the administrator is in their own office somewhere else, and the director is somewhere else, and the program manager is somewhere else. And those three people very rarely actually meet or talk to each other, and we'll all promise different things and all uh, facilitate different things at the project. Yeah, and, and clearly that's not, uh, that's not a way to... Well, that leaves you on stage at, yeah. with the company with not knowing what, yeah. Yeah, what you're supposed to do or, or what you're responsible for. Okay. And welcome back to that, yeah, but in the meantime, just before you, either, if you could just give us an idea, you, you drew up this sample yeah. contract. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about, uh, oh, I suppose, what you based it on? And um, how how much you feel that you know if you think that all <coughs> venues should literally stick to the same, or whether there can be nuance within within contracts, even in terms of who they're dealing with, yeah. or or whether or not we should just stick this is the way it is and take it or leave it. Well, I would say that Anna and um, Brian, my partner in, in my team, prepared this. I think based on a template, um, an existing contract yeah. that's currently in use. Yeah. yeah so. Like I think what is definitely 
merit in streamlining the contract and having some kind of standardised form of contract. I do think that it's going to change from production to production. And what we would always say as lawyers is have this piece of paper, have this contract reflecting the commercial decision and whatever you have agreed as a promoter or production company on the venue. And so it's going to change um, time and again. Um, we would always recommend that the contract is looked at in advance of the show. It's, it's much harder to, to try and get something agreed and finalised when you're scrambling you know, at the other end, yeah. trying to just get the piece of paper signed. It's much, much better to have it done in advance. And it's for the benefit of both parties. And it's really just what you're, you're talking about uh, today, just having everything clear um, and concise in, insofar as it's possible. But just so that each party knows where they're at, what their obligations are, what they're getting, what they're providing. And it's really just to have what the agreed terms are in clear um, writing. So I, I do think, like, if, if you're to look at this as a template, there might be things in it that you would definitely want to change and I'll have to defer to, to you the husband the knowledge in theatre. We don't really work in the, the theatre sector. But there'll be there be clauses in here that you might be see in a standard form contract like any provides you. Mm -hmm. Do you think, oh I like that? Yeah. I'm going to ask them to insert a, a, a clause like that into this contract. And it's always open to you as either a venue or a promoter if you're if you're handed a bad standard form of contract, it's open to you to try and negotiate that. You might get pushback straight away. It might say this is the standard form and you sign this so you know there's no deal. But it's always open to try and to, to you know get as, as much as you can as early on as possible. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to go through this or um, yes I know. The, the one area which I'm not clear about um, is um, I've understood from previous discussions with Brian and uh, other sisters that the contract is the contract yeah. and should remain focused on the terms and the key, you know, the key points that constitute it, that make it a contract. Yeah. Other things like uh, you know staffing levels, uh, technical staffing, the, what's going to be provided by the venue, um, what the production company are responsible for in terms of you know their tech uh, crews. Um, but that needs to, and marketing plans in particular, that there would be a suggestion that they don't form part of the contract because if they do, it makes them, it makes them enforceable in mm -hmm. terms of the contract and makes the contract very cumbersome. Where they're actually better as addendums to the contract, and they're clearly agreed and understood between the venue and the company at the time the contract is being signed, but that they don't form part of the contract. Now that's a legal. I don't know yeah. the legalities of that. Yeah, I think it's about striking the balance as, as to what you want in writing in, in, in a clause and, and the detail, like you're talking about publicity material and marketing material. If you don't know exactly what you're going to be providing for a particular production at the time of signing, I think it's fine to say, you know, this will be negotiated in good faith between the parties and something that's lighter and doesn't go into the specifics. But I think if you have that knowledge and if you have an agreement as to what it is you will provide. I think, it, like we would always say, it's better to, to have everything clear and to have it set out so that people know where, where they are. If it's a case where you can't and you're unable at, at the time of the contract signing to, to give that information, it's fine to do it by their side letter or their addendum. But all of those kind of other pieces of paper that relate to a contract, they all form part of a contract. and. Yeah. Can, can I just clarify that? that yeah. Yeah, the, 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 for instance, the number of posters a venue is expecting from a company, mm -hmm. if it's not necessarily directly in the contract, it's a, but as I as say, an addendum or an appendix, does it still have the strengths? I suppose it depends on how it's drafted. If it's drafted as a, an addendum or a side letter, um, but bolstering the, the terms of this contract, then it forms. It part of the part contract. Of the agreement of the contract. Because I don't know what other venue managers think, but that, there's, this key, there's a couple of key things. The technical will be one thing, but we actually have the marketing, <coughs> one marketing section, and sometimes you feel maybe it is a bit of an overkill, but it's the one area, or there's, there's, two, there's two areas, technical and marketing, where you really want companies to listen to us, this is what you need, and therefore that's what you want in the contract. But then if it is not really a contract, Term. It's not a term, you know. Uh, That's where the, 
the two areas where disputes yes, always arise most with, us, with yes. us um technical conscious you know after the fact yeah um, it's the one and the other two things which came up with you that way and um complete questions yeah. you know are of a commercial nature these do people give you less than you would like um yeah. frequently yeah are much much later than then yes than so, yeah. you know, like probably three days before the two opens but you can kind of remember it like um, yeah, I'd just, I'd just like to say about the Section 3 in this. Now, I know it's a sample contract, but one of the things that uh, would re I would really find important is... Uh, one of the things I find really important is uh, if I was asking the technical manager of the venue, uh, is... Sorry? I don't know. Just a little bit of sort of top there. Is it up? I think you've turned off at the break. Sorry. No, that's not top right. the top. I can talk now. It's all right. Yeah, you can, yeah. Um, it, it, it's the fact, say, for instance, just looking at uh, just looking just looking at um, say three one venue services. Uh, the venue will provide the following service facilities: full box office and ticketing facilities, front of house management and ushering staff, full bar on the evening of the performances. That's assuming there's a bar, um, and in certain number of technical staff. This is a bit now which I would be looking for as a production manager. In certain number of technical staff for the duration of the run. These staff will comprise or include a lighting technician and a stagehand. Now, the specificity of that is that you're assuming, first of all, that there's two staff in the venue. Lots of venues would only have one. Um, and secondly, if there were two or more in the venue, um, <coughs> quite frequently, and I think Dylan and anybody else here who is a venue person would back me up on this, that one person will be the lighting person, per se, and the other will be the sound person, even though they will both be able to cross over. But one ha would have more of a speciality than that and from the point of view of being a technician they're really only there to turn the board on for you or to fix problems if, if it arises so to put something as specific as that into it where a company could turn around and say but the contract says that i can get a lighting technician and a stagehand uh, neither of which might actually be in the venue all the way through the fit up that to me would be confusing you know and um, what I would like to see there is something that said uh, the venue will provide one uh, member of technical staff for the fit up for a number of hours and any staff over this would cost you this much. If Ronan was here, because mm -hmm. the stuff you get from Pavilion uh, is really clear. You're told exactly how much it's going to cost once you go over a set number of hours. And that's really what we want. Because then we can talk to the venue technical manager, we can plan our budget, we can plan everything, and we can do it that way. But I think it needs to be more in there uh, around that, because that sentence there is just kind of like it's, oh yeah, you'll get that. So, so I suppose the, work, the, the length of the working day and when the venue closes, yeah. literally the time it closes. Or it, or yeah. it, I, think, I think that there needs to be, because they, the other thing that happens is that there's very rarely anybody from the company there when the technical staff arrive in the theatre, they usually arrive either in the morning or the day before or whatever, and they're doing this and they don't know if they have a right to demand to work through the lunchtime. They don't know if they have a right to demand to work until 10 o'clock at night because it isn't in the contract. So actually being really specific about that is very important. But is there not a danger though, if you're very specific about these kind of things? You know when in, in the operation when you come into a venue and you know, the song problem, and you know the venue, Staff would be flexible in terms of time-wise to sort it out. Is there is there a way, or, do you, or would, is it better just not to include that? And you know, it, it, you well, it, 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 if if it's going to if it's going to be a situation for that, I, it's just that's a bit too vague. Um, yeah. it, it, even though it's very specific for me, um, it's some venues you can work through lunchtime. Like I mean, from a health and safety point of view, there always has to be a venue tech on yeah. the stage yeah. when. Uh, but you can go into venues where the venue tech would say, and I, I have been locked into a venue, it's where the venue tech goes out for their lunch. I've been left there alone uh, with my crew while the venue tech goes off because there's only one of them, instead of closing the venue. And that's them doing us a favour, but they're not really because they're contravening all sorts of health and safety laws. And if we had an accident during their lunch break, uh, then where does that leave everybody, including the venue? So, I mean, I think that... Uh, things like that, if, if the venue is going to, like, I mean, if there's two techs in the venue, uh, they can rotate their lunches, uh, mm -hmm. and there can always be one there. But if there is only one tech, 
So I think we have to look at the fact that even though it might hamper things, like I mean, I think there'll always be a certain amount of flexibility. Nobody's going. It's more likely that the uh, that the, the the company is going to say, "But you send in the contract," than that the venue te tech. If the venue tech doesn't want to work, they'll just say it's in the contract, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And the company will say, fine. But I don't think it's going to affect the flexibility because if you were, if you were to finish and focus at 10 o'clock at night and there was half an hour left to do four more lamps, I don't think there's any venue tech in the country that throw you out mm -hmm. that do the extra half an hour. That'd be kind of, you'd agree with me, Dylan, I'm yeah. sure, you know, you know, just to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it'll affect that type of flexibility. But I do think there's a certain requirement uh, to protect both the venue technical managers and the company from coming in and demanding things that really they shouldn't be looking for. The, con the converse of that is exactly what you just said. You know, there's no technical manager who would throw you out, but you know, there's there's also then kind of um, hidden or unknown, not unknown, but you know, kind of we uh, say that with the Panto Society that's been using the venue for ten years. You know, there's slightly different timing, so you would always be a ten to ten for getting days. You know. And then maybe when they're doing the tech dress, you would allow them to finish the tech dress rather than cut halfway through the second half. So that, that day usually is an 11 o'clock finish. And it's a kind of unsaid thing, you know. Um, and then obviously during the run of the show, we're, we are, although we're very clear about, you know, being gone within two hours of a finish of a show and a get up or not being in after 12, you know, say a show finishes at half 11 and... They're, they're chatting or doing notes. Notes for shows is usually a thing that kind of gets Eamon's blood up. You know, is, you, is that you'll do a 10 to 10 and then the director will want to <coughs> give notes. You know, they want to give notes in the venue and then because of the, if you're on your own as a technician, a house technician, and you don't have the weight where you're going to go into a room, you know, you know kind of uh, uh, a very high, high energy room with directors and actors and all giving notes and, and company members, you know, you, you can't go in as a technician at 10 o'clock and say, actually, time's up now, you know. Actually, and you can. That's, you can. <laughs> lots of them do. Well, some of them do, and what's happened there, you know, then you're in a whole area of conflict where you've got someone going, right, I want you out now, the club. And, and that, that's not conducive either, you know. So it's, and none of that is in the, in the contract. This, I, what I was meaning by a simplified document was really just for internal uh, information, you know, uh, I think the contract still stays as it is, and, and <coughs> I've seen a lot of these, it's some sort of simplified thing that you can go to and say, oh, this is what this venue, this uh, event I, has. Can I just come in on that in terms of the simplified document? The Town Hall Theatre, uh, Fergie is not here today, but he shared a document with me about six months ago, which I took to, to use in, in the line tree. Um, he calls it as, what you need to know, uh, yeah. W-Y, Whatever it is, they they like the acronym for that. What basically, I and mean, what it is, is I, I have a copy here of ours. It's a simplified form of the contract in plain English. Uh, how many seats we've got? What time we open? What time the box? Like an idiot's guide, really. And uh, we he put it together. It was very interesting. He put it together because he was fed up fighting with people like a week before the show or three weeks before the show or the night of the show or two weeks after the show, people basically saying to him, you say, you know, I, I thought we'd get this or you didn't tell us this when, when we ran to, to book the, the when we first saw it. And he, he, he basically said that each paragraph is, is a mistake he made while he was talking to promoters or companies. And so every time he made a mistake or every time he forgot to say something, he added it into a paragraph into this document. And, but, and then when you read it, actually, it is a summary of the entire contract in, in really bold, plain English, um, rather than the party of the first part, or, you know, and I know the public's not like that, but sometimes they are very hard, and very dense to read, uh, and, and by nature they need to be. And I have found it extremely useful. And it, it gets, I suppose, it, it's, it's a lot of it has the technical, uh, it, it would have, and again, that, that business on, we wouldn't come up against that very much, very often, because shows aren't generally um, created in our venue, they're more by and large showing show, but something like that, where notes, if, if a show or if a, a rehearsal finishes at 11, then it has to finish at 11, and that's very, you know. I think you find sometimes with local groups that actually they've been doing shows here for so long and they're, they're their own uh, organisation changes, you know, different secretaries, different... Um, yeah. Uh, that they might not even look at the contracts anymore, you know, they'll get them signed and send them back here. 
and the contract hasn't changed for 10 years maybe and obviously having a great relationship with the with the group and um, you know oh we will be we're always here to 11 on tech night you know or we're always and that's fine um, until it's not fine and then what actually could happen and maybe we've had some experience of that then post show if they're if they're upset about anything then suddenly the the the, the anxiety comes back on them because they've been given a charge that they never realized was in the contract because they sent it and they never heard it you know mm. and so it's that it, I, I, i've had trouble with you know, getting companies in for a meeting i would always like i would always like to talk to people on phones you know uh, as Nick said, I always like to have them in a meeting, at least in the cafe, you know, just so that, because then you go through all the back to basics and, you know, uh, timings and everything, and you go through all, and they can't, they, ha they have to re, uh, re, re familiarize themselves with all the uh, things that they need to know about the show that they're putting on, rather than this just happens every year. Mm -hmm. I think that, just, just one more thing, sorry. Uh, that, that going back to the clarity of communication, the reason I'm going on about getting such specific stuff into the into the contract is because that is what I ring up and ask about is how many crew are in the contract because I don't usually get a copy of the, the, the venue contract and I'm depending on what information has gone to the venue technical manager to find out um, because usually what I get from any company manager I work myself is oh just just ask the venue manager you know what they agree because they're trying to woolly it over I think yeah um, whereas uh, it would be much better for me, for my crewing levels, for the company, for the venue, for everybody, if it was very specific, you can have one tech. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Would, yeah. it, would it be uh, helpful then for, if production managers were to do up a kind of an idiot proof sheet, the kind of questions that you it's, need answered? I don't think it's so much the question, well, yes, but it is pretty basic. It's what's, what, what in your venue is going to cost my company money? Is what you're asking basically yeah. and whether it be crew whether it be equipment or whether it be whatever um you don't want to find out uh at the end of the first day of the fit up oh by the way those two fellas we had pumping stuff around all afternoon uh, they're going to cost you 60 yeah. euro each yeah. or that haze machine that you said you asked me did we have a haze machine and we said no but we can get you one but we didn't we neglected to say it's going to cost you this much you know yeah. so it's the clarity around that you know really but uh, well, and it, it's not a lot. It's just what's going to cost us money, you know, technically. Um, yeah, well, just kind of something that Marie and that you, um, yourself, Louise, um, I'd say in the 26 years that I've been touring around this country, I've never once seen a venue contract from a company or from, apart from probably what I'm looking at today. And I think that might be something that's really important is that like, just I looked at one um, obviously, I'm looking at something that would affect me, and one of the things here is that the promoter should be responsible for all aspects of physical production, or even the, uh, the promoter will in endeavour to ensure that all backstage areas, corridors, dressing rooms and toilets are kept tidy. And, you know, just even that sometimes, obviously, because company <coughs> companies sell, send crews out on the road, and possibly people like me, as a stage manager, is not tuned in to what what, what, what rights we have or what rights the venue has, uh, not even in terms of timings and closing it at lunchtime or anything like that, or amount of crew or costs for hazers and stuff like that. Really specific things that dressing rooms are tidy and whose responsibility or who's, respons who's responsible for what. So maybe it's, uh, that, that's a thing that possibly people who are going out on the road are made very aware of the document that, that they have to adhere to and the venue has to adhere to without the person who signed the contracts actually being physical, like, you know, like the company, you're not expecting your, like, general manager or executive to come out on the road just to make sure that the contracts are being, you know, kept in every venue or that the, the venue managers are there every hour of the day for that as well, you know. So maybe what you and Fergal have done, that simplistic thing, yeah. um, not so simplistic, I would imagine, it probably took you a lot of time to do it, but, but that is maybe offered around to everybody who's going out on the road and maybe even the company members you know yeah that would have no figures in it so yeah, nobody knows no, you know no just you, you know them, uh, drop -offs. theater forms for the drop offs to whoever would have access it say you know how can i ask just in terms so of the burger would be in touch on the road yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean has done that with them i mean i did that for the 
technical question here. Yeah, you know, he's made that available as a download to, any, to anyone who wants it. Either. Yeah, just as a follow up on that, like that's something that we're well, we're trying to make one of those actually, the, which which specifically that has that sort of like start to finish outlines the process. Like so, yeah. basically, what we expect from you and what you want to expect from us. Yeah. So that the, the kind of process, step by step, from the washing machine in the green room, etc., like all the way through, and for the specific and express reason that it can be shared with other members of the touring company without like their need needing to be access to. You know, without sharing contractual information, basically. Yeah. Um, so, so it teaches you, it tells you who you need to contact about which, you know, yeah. which yeah. question goes to which person. Which doesn't mean that everybody places. needs to be in the room at the same. Like, I don't need there to be the person who signed the contract there to, mm. for me to be able yeah. to go and say to somebody who I know is in charge, mm. uh, I think this is in our contract, so can you sort this out? Yeah, I mean, the thing or to me, because certainly that I would never have even thought. Of that element, but it, it makes sense that I mean, because the rest of the staff and the manager don't be bothered with contracts, they don't want to know, and we can understand that they don't want to know that that's my department, so I just get the contracts on and I file it away. And but equally, it's probably the same in the production companies, they just get the time and file it away. And the we think that we're giving you all this information, it's all in the contracts, it's all in the contract, but who's reading the contract? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, actually, that, that my question then was like, how do you? Do you need to build a sort of a little bridge with the clause in the contract thing? We know both parties have read and understood the terms of whatever that document yeah, is called. Yeah. I don't know if that's a useful thing to, to be putting in there. I, I mean, I think the contract sort of it protects you in the unlikely event of you know litigation, yes, but realistically, which one of us is ever going to let ourselves end up in court with a touring company mm. or another venue? And uh, you know, like the contract is sort of a bit for that, like the actual communication of how the venue works and what the mutual expectations are, I think has to be a separate conversation and probably needs a more informal set of documents and you know, a bit more sort of informal goodwill between the two parties and understanding what the needs are and early communication is probably the only way to resolve that, I think. Any other questions? Can I just ask something, yeah? Personally, I've had to deal with a contract problem about a year ago with some work I did. Um, and um, some of us didn't have contracts as artists. And dealing with equity in the UK, they were saying that a verbal agreement is as good legally, as legal standing, as much as a contract. And obviously, that's a different situation because that was actually a specific <coughs> amount of work. Um, which for a specific sum of money, so maybe that's a different situation. So I'm interested to know, this obviously makes it clear that we need to have contracts drawn up between the, the, the two different companies, um, because in case, you know, that just makes sense of the money, the financial size there in the contract, your terms of work, etc. there, because I know some of us were stung by having no contract there. I just want to legally, but where does that stand for you guys as solicitors, the verbal agreements, mm -hmm. what they stand in law? We would try and still everything to writing, obviously, um, with the artists that we would work with in the context of film and TV, it's of utmost important that there's a, a written contract there for IP reasons more so than, than anything, but um, I mean, like the general concept of contract law, what you need is like there's four aspects to it, offer acceptance, the intention to create legal relations and consideration. So well, there's probably a good argument there that you had a valid contract. When it's not in writing, it's, it's really not ideal. Um, it's very hard for one party over the other to argue what was intended. So just get it in writing and get it signed. <laughs> what about an email? Yeah. An email is, 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 is really fun. It's in writing, it's in the yeah, writing. I mean, yeah. It would have to have all the aspects to to a, a formal contract. Um, but yeah, we, we would conduct a lot of transactions over in and get things signed over in and electronically and all that kind of thing. But there has to be passing considerations or else there has to be What do you mean by the passing consideration is money or some kind oh, of thing yeah. 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 But if you said something you'd uh, let's see uh, some set of conditions on mm -hmm. the email back they would agree with you that. Is yeah. that as binding as a signature or something? It would just it would depend on the context and, and if you needed this if you needed that particular contract to be in, in writing, is it deemed what way it needed to be executed? Was the person with authority 
the person who signed off on it, all that kind of thing. So it really just depends on what the transaction is, what the context is, in the case by case. And um, just in the context of the contracts getting to the people who need to know, I mean, I've had in other venues that I've gone into had a written contract, or the company that was employing me as a production manager had a written contract with the venue. And uh, we met with the venue manager, we sat down, we talked about what it needed. And um, this particular case was a choir of 40 who said they're going to need chairs. They said, uh, um, yes, no problem. Then there was an orchestra of like six and it had a, a, an orchestra leader. The orchestra leader was going to kind of negotiate with the venue about what they needed and blah, blah, blah. So we turned up and there were no chairs. And so, you know, you've everybody arrived in the door half an hour after you and you've opened up the doors and we made sure our horizons were right and all that kind of stuff and we're expecting the furniture to arrive. Um, and then I met with the furniture manager, there was two of them in the venue, um, and he said, well, no one told me. So if the information isn't actually passed down within your own venue, it's completely useless to have it in writing, a variable contract, and all of the other things, if the furniture manager is gone, well, I gave all those chairs away, you know. Yeah. So that that's kind of, I'm just, uh, in terms of planning, you know, it needs to go within the venue as well. You were saying about not getting the information sometimes. It's the same with us. I mean, I'll agree things. If I don't pass that information on to the various departments in the alley, the guy standing on stage is going, I don't know, you know, this is what's happening right here. It goes back to what you were saying earlier on about the business of the venue before you sign that contract. I presume for a promoter to, to sign a contract with a venue as to what is going to be there on the day without having seen it, without having you know, satisfied yourself that what you need will be there. I think it just goes to, again, it's another bit of reason for me to the venue. Yeah, but as well as that, I suppose what Ashley's saying is that even visiting the venue and seeing, well, and it's, you know, the event maybe six months down the yeah. line, unless the communication within the venue is clear, yeah. um, it doesn't matter how many times you visit the venue, if the person is in charge of getting the particular aspects of, the sh of that show. Yeah. And I suppose that's why within, uh, we actually, uh, we wouldn't put the, that kind of detail into a contract. Because again, because the contract just gets filed away, it, because it, it's about trying to, uh, at the time, it's you're talking to the person actually this is a very odd show you're actually going to need four tiers on stage uh it's a it's, it's at the time of booking we'll be just sending an email straight away to the second manager i know this is six months online but they, they're looking for four tiers we're going to get four tiers but it's the it's, it's the re remembering it's the because it, you know and things things move at such a pace and you know you take a, a, a phone call or you, you, you agree a booking and then you might be about to email the technical manager and then somebody knocks the door and says, hey, can we come out here for a minute and the email is forgotten about it. And then what happens? As you strive, it happens on the day. Actually, um, There's no cheers. Um, there's a lovely template I got from uh, the National Theatre in the UK um, where they do a, an events programme and they all meet around the table and discuss them, you know, once every week or a half and whatever. But it's just done by, it's done by date, it's done by what's coming up next. But as all those discussions happen, they input into this document so if it needs 40 chairs, it's gone in, even if it is six months away, so that when that comes around for discussion, it's still in the document. Yeah. Again, I could share that if people wanted, it's uh, very simple. Um, but it, it says, it gives you all the context to everybody you, you need to contact to do with that show. So just as the information comes in, it goes straight into this document and, and gets filed for when that event comes up. You know? And so it might seem obvious, but it's, I, I don't know, it, it, I know in some venues it doesn't happen, but it, it, you have to team meetings once a week. And you look forward, you, this is when the last week, when you're discussing the least problem in the week ahead, you catch the things that have fallen off the table. Oh, you know, I forgot, Jesus, this, they need this. And okay, you might want your week to do it, but at least it's some notice instead of on the day when you're arriving in. And not all venues do that. Um, but I, I presume, well, certainly it, it, it is getting better, but it, is, it seems obvious, but um, it's really important. I know more of a contract can protect you in the event exactly. of open communication. You know, the chair is still out there and a you know, phone call to your solicitor in front of them. Yeah. Is that the same in every in every contract? I got phone calls and they just received it. And they received the technical page of the contract. Not, uh, well, yeah, you get contacted by the venue manager when, 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 when or the technical manager when they've actually seen the contract, but it's been handed down from, from a room to them. Normally, they haven't done the contract. No, just the technical page. The technical, yeah. yeah. Which, which, 
it in many venues is the same regardless of uh, you know regardless of the show. Right, so same detail. I mean the chairs would have gone down. No, down. but that wouldn't be in the contract. Right. You're not going to be putting for every like every different show will have a different technical requirement. So you're not going to be putting in the technical requirement of this particular show into the contract. Right. Because it's you'd be forever writing contracts. You couldn't possibly where the writer comes in. Where the writer, exactly the same thing. The writer should be hand back should be gone into the writer and then be handed on to the technical manager. Yes, yes, exactly. And in fact, a lot of the time the technical writer we would say to the company, get your te your get your people to talk to and get your technical manager to talk directly to our technical manager and the, the technical manager goes between them. And then if there's any particular thing that the technical manager is concerned about or is going to cost us extra money or whatever, then it's flagged. He said, are we agreeing to this? Yes or no? Any other questions? Well, just that I I would add to what Paula said. That I have had late night calls from a production manager asking me to double check a contract. Um, okay. You know, because they want to know that they have all the information. So I think I think it would be useful to give the production manager all the information <coughs> from the contract, which is relevant to the technical aspect of the show. And then you know that includes getting time and, and all those things. And then there might still be late night phone calls, you know, because that's what we do. But it might yeah. alleviate that a bit. And the other thing I would say for like for this kind of standard contract, I, I would probably start with a list of definitions so that you know what you mean by your terms. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in this contract, there's a a minimum guarantee potential as well as a guaranteed first call. You know, and to me those two are the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I, would, I would specify guarantee means, royalty means, mm -hmm. um, like the inward three percent should be a, should be of net box office, not gross box office. Uh, so there's a lot of, I would make it very clear, like the, the things that I myself have uh, learned from, let's say, is to, to, to be really clear about the royalties and what they come out of, like mm -hmm. NS, mm -hmm. net box yeah, office, not gross yeah. box office, yeah. and then uh, that money goes to the artist, it doesn't go to the company. Uh, make it really clear if you have a guarantee, whether that's for the run or for, for per show. I've seen other people make that mistake. Okay. You know, okay. That, that, that's a really big one. And then to really make sure you negotiate all the way to the end of the of the box office. That happened to us one time when we were touring King of the Shoe and, and we were negotiating with the final 10% of box office thinking it'll never come to that. Yeah. But it did come but to that. Yeah. So we were glad that we had no negotiated. And just generally, I would say anything that has a financial implication, I would put in the contract. So the number of hours a venue is giving for free in technical support, I would put it in the contract. Like, like anything that has a financial implication, because yeah. then you're covered um, by the contract. One of the one of the things that isn't I don't think here at the moment has come up a lot with Aim recently is um, uh, the legal the legality of using certain images or certain videos or uh, I mean uh, Imro kind of covers music and sound um, but with more and more video projection being used in amateur productions they're not really aware of their responsibilities you know in relation to um, licensed uh, imagery or you know they're downloading stuff. Google or whatever, and that's become a bit of a grey area where he's actually getting quite vocal with them saying that they can't use these things, you know, um, uh, Disney is an obvious one where, you know, a promoter recently who, who toured all the venues in the country has, um, was kind of quite jovial about telling me stories where he was kind of arrested in the foyer of a theatre in, in Nottingham doing one of these kind of Disney shows, and, and, and he was arrested and charged, and the company was... Um, find uh, 80,000 sterling, you know, and then um, because he built all the characters himself, built all the set and did Disney Club, you know, and that, that show uh, was quickly brought to a halt and then replaced by the Three Bears or something, you know, which didn't have a, a legal uh, legal license. But so Disney is one company that will be out looking or have people in every town and every, you know, looking for infringements. Can, can I just ask, who, who is responsible there? Is it the company? If the company infringes the, the, that there, is it the company or is it the, the theatre? 
Well, I think in the contract it would probably come under the promoter's responsibilities, mm -hmm. but um, who enforces it? You know, um, when it comes to say even a, uh, uh, you know, a, a company that um, a live music <coughs> event that are singing lots of songs, you know, from the old days, uh, or uh, and have got children and choirs and they're all singing songs. They they're, they're often you know there's often they don't come under IMRO, they're not being paid for, and the license is, is included. But what, I actually, what I actually meant was, uh, is, is, the, is the venue uh, liable, if that happens in the venue, or is the company liable? Is there a venue liability, I'm or is it just nice? Sure, really, but we, we take it on board that we are liable, because we're the people that are going to be contacted by Disney or whoever, and say, what are you doing, for, you know, that you haven't got the rights to use that. So, it he, is, he, was, he, 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 he was known as the promoter of that. Show so I think he was directly kind of targeted and arrested. And then and to go back to the Emerald thing, yeah. I mean the Emerald, we have to pay it. Like we 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 are very strict on organizations who do use in music in any way. We we're not we're not going to say if they say to us we didn't uh, perform copyrighted music and we know they did. We just say sorry, we have to pay yeah. three percent and that's it. You Unfortunately, know, I, that just. That, that kind of thing feeds back into the whole issue of contracts and uh, where uh, promoters will provide us with a set list prior to the show and actually the technicians sitting there doing lights for the show go actually that's not on the set list or, you know, and they've completely changed the set list and by that time they've, they've, they're out of the venue, out the back door and then you're kind of then coming into conflict again with your own members of staff where you're you know, in the office going into the administrator well this is not what it's and so, you know, um, it's very difficult for because basically, then that puts the technician who's the only witness to any event in a position of being, uh, you know, as I say, like, uh, am I responsible for stopping a show? I know um, shows have been stopped, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very you have to be a very brave person to do that. Yeah, thanks. Can I, just in terms of who's legally responsible, I'm just wondering about because I suppose as a theatre company, if, we, if we're producing a new play, we would. Have a contract with the writer they won't defame anyone um you know so we sort of we feel if he if the writer does if he or she does then that's their fault but then a the venue might say in their contract that we won't want to play that would defame anyone or you know make them liable so the venue feels we're responsible so in theory you're passing it all along um <laughs> thankfully we've never had that but probably we did over the year with the yeah, yeah. <laughs> injury it. um and we and it was a play called guaranteed and it was about real living people that the that there were court cases pending against so we all got letters from the dpp threatening us, uh, saying that we would be all sued and we were all liable at the venue, the directors personally, the writer personally, the people, everyone artistically involved personally, and the company, like everyone was, was getting letters. So well, we, we had lawyers all over the script, you know, throughout the development process, we had two sources for everything. But we had to reassure, you know, Emer that was just inviting in, fish out, we think, you know, this would be grand, uh, that we actually were, everything was in order. So I, I'm just wondering, yeah, what, like, it, we, we didn't actually lie by anyone, we weren't sued, uh, we had been careful, but if we hadn't, I was, it is, yeah, I was interested to know if, um, if, um, if, um, if, 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 if,
you know, was the name of the poster and was the venue where it was happening. So, you know, they hit us first and that happened, that's happened twice. But, you know, it's been kind of, you know, it's been dead by our solicitor, but, you know, they, they assumed the liability lay with us first, you know, if they were argued. And do you think we need to be, have tighter clauses in the context covering that? What do you do? I mean, I, I think you, as a venue, you would want to make sure that the producer of the show has all the appropriate licenses mm -hmm. to use whatever Which is, they well, have. that is in most of yeah. them, if anyone's ever seen, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's an educational piece in that, though, that some people don't understand copyright. Now with things going up on Twitter and going up on Facebook, and they're not understanding copyright in the same way. We have trouble with our archive department and things coming out from the Abbey through, um, through digital media and all different sort of ways. But, uh, some of the archive has been made digital to uh, go away. Mm -hmm. So we'll see an image and then go, ah, oh, that's mm -hmm. our copyright and we haven't been listed, we haven't been yeah, uh, credited in any way. Um, now, we don't <laughs> charge her, but we still have to be credited. Or we may have to get the permission of the person whose original documentation it was, mm -hmm. uh, or original image or original um, material. So especially if it's a, a photograph um, and the copyright on photographs, you'll always see, you know, mm -hmm. Ross Cavan on the end of a photograph. Mm -hmm. Because he owns the image, and people don't. I think there's an education piece in copyright law, particularly. Yeah. yeah. And that depends on the contract you have with the photographer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anna. So it was just um, again a sort of a, a maybe an overly cautious question, but my understanding is that copyright infringements can rest with the company, and the company is liable. But defamation is actually the person, and you can't actually uh, you can't actually lay off the liability for defamation onto a company. Like a company doesn't defame. No, a person. A um, person does. Yes, but in the same way, like if somebody is on RTE and defames somebody, is no RTE is, is also liable because they often they have given out awards <coughs> and defamed on program. So in the sense of that it, they, they were the conduit for it to be broadcast. And would that not be the same case in a venue? Somebody stands on stage in a venue and says. Uh, something defamatory. Yeah, it's just very difficult in a live context yeah, that one that night when they're, when they're when they're gone. Rather than go yeah. all the way. Uh, how do you? Um, True, but then but they're settling because they don't feel their indemnity is strong enough, or that their case is standing. Yeah, so they they end up paying out anyway, which means the the the, the last the venue could end up paying out as well. I, I don't know the law. I mean, it's no, not about the law. Like, 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 something that's uh, illegal, but yet at the same time, if it's been minded by lawyers throughout the process, you obviously felt that it wasn't. Uh, we were actually sure everyone that we had yeah, done that, that we had felt confident, that. Okay. but we were surprised that, yeah, the three and I think maybe it's in your board, you know, yeah. better, that, 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 that the DPP felt everyone involved was, was pretty... Uh, I presume the DPP hadn't mind. seen the script, and didn't know no, no, they what it was no. going to be, yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, to those that legal help there, was that a large cost or was it somebody that you knew that was just helping you out? Um, it, it was, well, it was, um, it, it was somebody who was already doing it for one of the national newspapers. So it was during the Anglo Times breaking and stuff. So they had done all the legal stuff for one of the national newspapers and we asked them to do it. So we, so we, got, a, we got a fairly good rate, um, but their, their sort of, their, they, they had all, we had the benefit of their knowledge from having probably charged the national newspaper a lot more. Right. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Or I think it's just coming to four o'clock. Oh, uh, uh, there was a thing that came up the last time when, when we decided to do this uh, um, that frequently um, the venue will get a signed contract and the promoter will also. A signed contract, and that in that case, no contract exists. Is that correct? If the promoter issues 
What do you mean so, by that? So the venue issues a promoter with the contract that signs it. So the promoter issues the venue with the contract. And frequently, according to the venue managers that were here, they signed that too. But there was a, an opinion expressed at that time, positive and legal opinion, which is, I would say they knew, that in that case, no contract existed. But that this is a practice that happens frequently. Sorry, am I the only one who remembers this? Yeah, I, don't know. No, that's it. I would say that two contracts would be Which one has recent? I mean, it would, it would really depend on the, the facts of that, like which, which contract predated the other. Was it the intention that the, the second contract was to override and replace the first? Is there any language in the second contract to say that? Or? In ours, we put in thoughts that in the event of a conflict that our contract yeah, like something like that. that gives the protection to yeah, I mean, if, if they were both signed contracts, yeah, yeah it would. Yeah. Well, then, would the code of practice being devised here advise that there should be no more than one contract for one engagement? I would assume so, because so, well, certainly, we, we even if we are delayed in issuing a contract, if it's a good issue, what is it? No, no, no. The contract always comes from the venue. I think that was something that was a kind of a chance your arm thing, and I don't think it was a widespread practice. I just, I just think there were some incidents of it having happened, and it was mentioned as something because I think it was in the context of contracts not being contracts not being clear, and contracts not having been uh, passed on to particularly in venues from the venue manager to the technical manager and that the technical staff of the company were getting different information about what they were getting, which is why I'm kind of quite strong about that, being very clear. In, in my experience, it doesn't, it, it's rare at the Everyman, but it happens occasionally, mostly with bigger music acts whose agent doesn't want to go ahead and give you the things you need to confirm the gig until this sort of short or one page contract is signed, which often doesn't cover half the things that your contract will, but it's more to sort of expedite the process that you would sign. I mean, I would, I would say, very much say that we're, we're speaking to the converted here, all our biggest problems are not with this sector at all, it's up to the head, it's, it's, it's music at the moment. But that would seem to feed into what you're saying today, is that if it does come from the venue, then that actually gives a lot of support to new companies that may, yeah. do, may not have the management yeah. skills to kind of create contracts for each venue they're going to. If the venues are all providing them with contracts, then that takes a great burden off them uh, in administration yeah. and so on. Yeah, that's Uh, we've just something you said there that the, ve the contract must always come from the venue, which is my understanding as well. A, a couple of instances last year where we were waiting for a contract from a big and a tiny festival, uh, and both instances they were just like, oh yeah, just knock something together for us. I was like, I have 200 shows this year, I've not put together a contract for everyone. Um, so maybe a sample one could be made available on theatre form for people who don't have contracts ready to hand to, to access the thing. And in, in the end, it's Two days out, and I've been begging for one. I just stick it all in my email and say, "Are you happy with this?" I'm happy, and they reply yes. But one was for a festival that really probably should have done better, and possibly very much had contract contract for other people, just not for us. Um, but good to know that it is always from the venue. I presume, Anna, that that sample contract is on the form. It is used an amended version of the building. Yeah. Okay. And also the interpretation, the what you need to know. Further to accompany it, I'm the idiot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a large fee. <laughs> the idiot guy. <laughs> the idiot guy, yeah. That's what it boils down to. Okay, I think that's the end of the session. Thanks to all the panel